In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Nick Tim and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program. Great to have you with us and we warmly welcome you whether, wherever you're watching today, uh, across the UK and around Europe and maybe even uh, watching on the internet. So great to have you with us. Don't forget you can email us at info at in the last days .com if you want to uh, write into the program. We'd love to hear from you. Um, this week we have a very special guest. We have uh, uh, Michael Palmer. Welcome to the program, Michael. Thanks, and um, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, what happened. Uh, there was a terrorist act and very sadly your son and your grandson were killed um, just uh, outside of Kiryat Arba. And so we want to first of all say we're so sorry what happened. We send our condolences. I know a lot of our viewers who are watching will be upset and We'll be sending their condolences, so we're, that's the first thing we want to do. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks to your viewers as well for, uh, for those thoughts. They are helpful to us. Um, so um, the first thing we um, want to do is to just to go through what happened. Uh, if you can run us through that. and. Um... Okay, so this was um, Friday, September 23rd, 2011, and... Um, Asher was at home in Kirat Arba and his wife was at her parents' house in Jerusalem and they were going to spend um, Shabbat, spend Saturday together at her parents' house. So early in the afternoon, Asher took Yonatan, his son, my grandson, put him in his car seat, strapped him in the back of the car and headed out onto the road to drive from Kirat Arba to Jerusalem, which is about um, uh, maybe a one hour drive or so. It was a nice sunny day, the sky was blue. And, and the, the, this, the road 60, is that right? It's Highway 60, that's right. So he headed out onto, the, onto Highway 60, and probably at more or less the same time as he was heading out, there was a group of terrorists in a town nearby who were in the process of planning to attack a Jew. They didn't really know Asher, they didn't know Yonatan, they didn't really care who it was they got. They were looking for an Israeli car, and they were intent on killing the people who were in that car. So. They had actually been practicing their method for about a month, so there were a number of other attacks the same group had had launched uh, in that more or less in that area. And so they, I guess, were, had worked it out and were probably getting more confident that they could be successful this time. So they um, they selected a, a stone actually to do this. And when I say stone, uh, can I use this? I'm talking about something that's about as big as this, and perhaps four inches thick or so, not, not something you could grasp in one hand. So it's obvious to anybody, I think, that selecting a projectile that size and that weight, getting into a car and launching a projectile from that car to another car after practicing this method for a month is certainly demonstration of really an intent to, to kill the individuals in the, in the car being attacked. So about the time Asher was probably pulling into the gas station at Kirat Arba to fill up his tank, they were probably heading out into Highway 60, and there were two people in this car of a gang of, of five individuals. In this particular attack, these two people were the ones who were determined to kill somebody. Um, Asher headed out on the road thinking he was going to meet his wife, who happened to be about five months pregnant at the time. Um, this, the, these two individuals got into their car, um, onto Highway 60. At some point, they targeted Asher's vehicle they um, approached it in the opposite direction. So if I can use two props, this would be Asher and this would be the terrorist. So they were approaching like this. As they got closer to Asher's car, they lowered the window, lifted up this very significant heavy stone and projected it or hurled it out, launched it from their vehicle onto Asher's vehicle. Um, they were, they, smashed his windshield, the projectile entered his vehicle, hit him in the head, probably killed him instantaneously. At that point, the car was driverless and it immediately swerved off the road and careened off the side of the road into a ditch. And in that careening off the road, Yonatan, who was strapped in his baby carrier in the back seat, was killed. 
So at the end of the incident, the terrorists had killed both Usher, who was going to be 25 about a month after he was killed, and Yonatan, who was about a week shy of one year old. And um, when, when was the first, uh, when, what was the first time that you knew, knew about this? Uh, well, I was actually in the United States then, getting ready to come back to Israel for the holidays, and I got a phone call from my wife, which was probably uh, a couple of hours after the deaths of Asher and Yonatan. And uh, we heard the interview you did on uh, Marat Sheva on uh, Israel National Radio, and uh, that in itself is so upsetting, but, but what happened was that afterwards, instead of it being described as a terrorist incident, the um, original report, I understand, from the army was that it was an accident, that the car had, uh, he'd lost control and, and driven off the road. Right, that's what they told the family, and when my wife spoke to me, that's what she told me. And I, um, personally, I, I know the road there, and I was familiar with the area, and it didn't seem credible to me that it could have been an accident, because in order for a vehicle to crash and kill two people, one of them, both of them strapped in, one in a car seat, you have to be going pretty fast. And that part of the road, it just was impossible to go at that speed. I was skeptical, and it turned out um, that there was actually no physical evidence that it was an accident. If there was an accident, you would expect to have skid marks. People don't simply drop the wheel and lose control. It happens in stages, there's a moment of panic or accident, and then there's pressing on the brakes. So there were no skid marks on the road. So the, the, uh, the police and the army knew immediately that it was not an accident. Um, and as a matter of fact, I even have some new information on that. I got an email just today from somebody who was actually on the road at the same time in a bus, and they were stopped at the traffic jam that was caused by this. And they were told by the people there on the scene that it was actually a death due to a stoning. So it was known on the, at, on the spot all the time that it wasn't. Now, for some reason, the Army concocted or put out a story that it was an accident. Um, that's what they told the families. You'll have to ask them why they did that. I don't really know um, why they did that. They knew it wasn't correct. Uh, so we know there's terrorism being living in the land, but a lot of people watching, some things are not reported. Do you think that it's because the, the Israeli government wants to keep things you know, that this, this image of peace in the land, or...? I don't... You know? it, it, as far as Asher and Yonatan are concerned, I don't think the Israeli government made any attempt after the initial couple of days to not report the story. Um, like I said, why they wanted it to be look, look like an accident, I don't know. Within three days, within two days, really, they came clean and were honest and told everybody what happened. The physical evidence was irrefutable uh, from what they found in the car. I, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't know why they did that, and I don't know if they have other motives or whatever, so I just I mean, you can under, I can understand in a way that people want, you know, there to be this, this image of peace, but I think the problem is that when, they, when terrorism isn't reported, it's a false image, and we need to be truthful, I think, to, to tell people what's really happening, and that's what we are doing on in the last days. We try to... Right show what's really happening. And, well, you're and stepping up to that challenge, but I think if there was for reporting in Israel, the place where there wasn't for reporting was outside Israel. Um, and that may be a reflection of just what you said, which is here we understand what's going on, I think, but outside Israel there may be more of a sort of a um, wishful thinking that's guiding the way editors see stories and the way reporters report them. And uh, it's, I think it is wishful thinking and certainly is terrorism going on here. It's not as bad as it has been, but it, it's still here. And if you've got any questions about that, don't forget uh, you can email us at info at in the last days .com. Now, um, um, the uh, other thing I uh, heard on the radio when you were speaking to Racheva was about the trial, because mm -hmm. um, not only you've, uh, and again, we're very sorry that you have to go through all of this. Gosh, you know, you've been so th through th so much, but not only. Um, do you have to, you know, there's the, the incident itself, but now you're in the middle of um, uh, the trial for the, the terrorists. That's right. And um, maybe you can tell us a bit about that as well. Okay, well, that's a pretty long, drawn-out process. So uh, just Sunday this week, two days ago, 
there was one hearing and I was at that. Um, there's going to be another hearing tomorrow and, and from the way it's been explained to me there are a lot of small steps and at the end of a year or maybe more all those small steps add up to a trial and a legal process for these individuals. So there are actually six people who have been charged with one aspect or another, another of this case. Two of them were actually in the vehicle that launched the projectile that killed Asher and Yonatan. Um, the, these are the terrorists? The terrorists, and they're being charged with intentional murder, those two. There are another three who were in, in the support group and in part of the gang from which these two um, came from, and they were all, all five of these individuals were involved in that terrorist spree that went on for about a month before Asher was killed. There was a sixth individual, and his his um, sort of, it's hard to imagine somebody doing this, but what he did was once Asher was dead, he went up to his body, took, took Asher's weapon out of the car, Asher had a weapon with him, and stole it and ran away with that. So he is on trial for that. So there are six individuals, and um, there are a lot of steps. Actual presentation of evidence is going to start tomorrow, and I'm planning on being there. And um, this is because this this murder, these two murders, happened in the West Bank. Um, this is a trial that happens in the military justice system here in Israel. So um, the military is in charge, and. Um, the lawyers for, the, for the, the terrorists are actually not part of the military, they're independent. Um, I don't know who pays for them, but they're, they're not working for the military, the prosecution is, is military. And we've also hired an attorney um, to help us negotiate and handle the various steps in this and, and, and to communicate with the military and the prosecution. And, and mostly what we want help with is making sure that there is no, no backing down and no plea bargaining for these people. So it's not unusual um, for prosecution to say, well, let's just get this thing off the books and get going, and that's what we don't want to happen. This was deliberate murder, and we, we really intend on uh, doing everything we can to make sure the people who did it receive the full sentences and, and serve those full sentences in prison here. So that's the legal process, and like I said, it's, it's, there are many steps, and we're right at the very beginning of that. Now, um, uh, one of the things that shocked me was that um, the terrorists who are meant to be on trial seem to have had a lot of support in the court, which you wouldn't have imagined in Israeli court. I mean, not that we don't want to see justice done, but they have uh, apparently had a lot of people coming. I don't know whether it was family or friends, but people who were there, supporters, a lot of supporters in the court, is, yeah, is that right? Yeah, it, for, for me personally, it was an extremely painful experience to be face to face with the six men who killed my son and my grandson. Um, I, I mean, I, it's, I can't even explain how difficult it is to sit in a room with those guys. It was even more painful to see, the, to see that these individuals were verbally, vocally supported by their family members in the court, in the presence of the, of the military court. And I can't speak to Asher. I can't pick up Yonatan and look at him. Um, why is it that went through my, the question went through my mind, why is it that these people who are accused with killing Asher and Yonatan, and most likely did, and we'll see that um, over time, why is it that they are able to communicate freely with their relatives in the court? Um, the, the authorities in the court gave, were, had a deaf ear to my complaints about that. They just told me to sit down and shut up. Uh, it's something I had to endure again on Sunday, and I, I imagine tomorrow when I'm there, it'll be the same, the same carnival with them shouting support back and forth. So, I, you know, it, it, like you said, it's, it's shocking, really, worse than that to see terrorists allowed to receive support in a courtroom when they're standing accused of murder. And do you think that's because it's, it's um, um, the, the defense organization rather than if, for example, if it was happening in um, um, Jerusalem or in, um, not, in the, not in the Judea Samaria, but if it was happening um, in Tel Aviv or something like that, do you think it would be different? Or? Do you think it's particularly difficult 
because it's the, a defense court that's the, the military. Well, I, I've never had, I've never been in a, at a court in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, so I, I don't know if the same kind of activity goes on there. I'm, it may not. Um, I, I, I really, like I said, I, I sort of can't fathom why this is allowed. So it's, it's something that I, I, I can't explain it. I don't understand why it's allowed. Like I said, I can't speak to Asher and Yonatan, why these people can speak to their family, not just speak to them, but receive encouragement from them. Uh, when I'm sitting in the room, mourning my son and my grandson, mm. it's a question that it's needs to be out there. Really. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's terrible. Um, now, uh, uh, Asher was, ma uh, was married to, um, if you can remind me of the name, Pua. to Pua. 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 Yeah. Um, and um, you also have another uh, grandson that's been born since then. Right, granddaughter. Your granddaughter, sorry. Right. Yeah. So I, I mentioned Asher's wife was five months pregnant when her husband and her son were murdered. Um, she delivered that baby in January, and that was um, no problems at all. That was a very good delivery. So Asher has a daughter named Orit, who unfortunately will never know her father, um, will never hear his voice, will never be picked up by him or kissed by him. So that's a difficult thing for me as a grandfather to, to deal with. It's going to be difficult for Orit, and it's difficult for Pua. But. Is there support for people? or? you know, um, from the government or community? Do they, is there support for people who've been through terrorism? Um, nothing you get from the government even it comes anywhere close or near compensation. There's no such thing. So is there support? Yes, there's, there's unfortunately in Israel a, a system that's been very well used and functions very well. So the government has a support system. Um, it doesn't help, to tell you the truth. Asher and Yonatan are in my mind constantly, all the time. That doesn't go away. I know Pua and my wife and Asher's friends, his brothers and sisters have the same situation. So um, your support it doesn't really do anything, but it exists. And it's, it's in Israel, unfortunately, like I said, it works very efficiently. Now, uh, we were talking before the program, and you, uh, we, you mentioned there was a project um, out of this terrible situation, um, there's a project to, to remember Asher, and maybe right. you can tell the viewers a bit yeah, about that. I'd be that. very happy to. Um, as we talked about earlier, Asher was going on 25. He had finished his, his military service. He served in the Israeli Navy. He had, had gone to yeshiva here in Israel, and he was just starting out on his professional life. He was accepted for the Jerusalem College of Engineering, and um, he had finished a preparatory program, was going into the first year of that when he was murdered. So um, the pain of not seeing him succeed in that was difficult. And one way of dealing with that is to help other people who might be like Asher be successful. So what we've decided to do is set up a scholarship fund at the Jerusalem College of Engineering in Asher's and Yonatan's names. And um, we are planning on funding that with some money from our, our own resources and contributions as well, and making scholarships available to people like Asher, that is, people who are starting out on the career and have a family, because that's a very difficult responsibility to be both a student and have a family to take care of. And, um, and hopefully we'll be able to restore some percentage or some part of what was lost when Asher was killed. We don't want terrorists to win, and when they can wipe out what Asher would have done, that's a victory. So what we're trying to do is, is like you said, get something positive from this and beat terror by, by making Israel and the land of Israel a successful and beautiful place to be. And if the viewers uh, would like to make a donation, if you want to make a donation today, we're going to put the uh, details right now onto the screen, uh, how you can uh, contact uh, Michael, how you can make a donation uh, for this college uh, uh, fund and uh, uh, you people can contact you at the uh, details on the on the screen right 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 now we're just getting this set up and hopefully over the next few weeks it'll be set up and ready to go so in the interim as Martin said um, 
my details are showing, please just get in touch and we'll be able to put you in touch with people at the college and, and you'll help us keep the work that Asher started going and help us beat terrorism here in Israel and everywhere. And so Asher was going to go to do engineering. Right. He wanted to be a mechanical engineer. And now, uh, what's happening with the family home? Are they, are they still using it or is it...? Um, well, Asher and Pua and Yonatan were actually living in the apartment that my wife and I lived in in Israel a few years ago. And um, it's been vacant since they were killed. Nobody really, nobody in the family has the strength to go back to that apartment and look at it. Is, and that's in Kiryat Arba, is it? Yes, there? right. Gosh. And uh, do you think, because um, the government is saying that uh, things are safer now, do you think that's the truth? Or, you know, with the, what happened with, with uh, your son and grandson, do you think the roads are safer now? Or, because there's, there's some people are saying, you know, this, the, they took away all the checkpoints and... Um, yeah. Um, well... The road that Asher was killed on is a road that's open to anybody with a car. Jews and Arabs alike drive on that road, and we can see what happened. So, unfortunately, taking away checkpoints and things like that leads to terror acts, and including murder, including the murders of Asher and Yonatan. And maybe if the, if the checkpoints had been there, I don't know, but maybe those are things that stop, hopefully will stop those kind of things happening. It creates a presence on the road, and in fact, there is a checkpoint in the vicinity of where this attack occurred that's not being used anymore. Now, uh, I wanted to talk a bit about what's happening. So the terrorists are in jail waiting, awaiting tomorrow and waiting the, the process. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they will be, they'll be sentenced and uh, presumably to a, a jail sentence. Is, is that right? Hopefully they'll be found guilty. I mean, there seems to be unequivocal evidence that, that they are guilty. Um, the two who murdered Asher are facing um, life in jail if they're convicted of intentional murder, and others have um, lesser penalties than that that they're facing. And the whole the whole system isn't it, you know the whole um, education system needs to change as well, doesn't it, in the Palestinian Authority because there's a, so much hatred in the in the education, and uh, it's like. There's a whole work to be done, isn't there, to... We, we need well, right, you can just imagine um, the, the... It takes... It, it, it takes a certain state of mind to go out and kill somebody you don't know because they happen to be Jewish. And that doesn't appear out of nowhere. So yes, there is an education system and even more than that, support systems in the Palestinian Authority that encourage thinking that leads to these kinds of terrorist acts and other kinds of terrorist acts. And I've been living in Israel since 1985, before the Oslo Accords and after the Oslo Accords. And the hatefulness against Jews and the dehumanization of Jews um, in educational material and in speeches that come out of the Palestinian areas hasn't changed. And I think it's actually gotten worse over that time. And um, I wanted to talk a bit about the rock these, this rock throwing generally, these rock throwing incidents, which aren't always reported because for some unknown reason, it doesn't seem to have, you know, if the terrorists are shooting at people, that's treated very seriously. But if they are just throwing rocks, yeah. they don't seem, it doesn't seem to, exactly. I don't Look, understand. As I mentioned earlier, this particular gang had been working for about a month or more, um, perfecting their method of killing somebody. And Many of those attacks had been reported to the authorities and they weren't followed up on because they were, like you said, quote unquote, rock attacks and therefore not serious and not worth dealing with. And the consequence of that is two needless deaths of two blameless souls. So, yes, there is something wrong there. And um, um, the, 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 the funeral was at Kiryat Arbor, is that right? That you had the. The funeral was in Kiryat Arbor. That was actually. Asher and Yonatan were killed on a Friday, the funeral was Sunday. And um, uh, is there a place in Kiryat Arba that they are buried, or is that in Yerushalayim? They're actually, they're buried in the ancient Jewish cemetery in Hebron. In Hebron. So um, Jews have been living in Hebron really since the time of, of King David. 
and there is an ancient Jewish cemetery there. And when Jews came back to Hebron in 1968, and afterwards that cemetery was um, cleaned up and has been used, and Asher and Yonatan are both buried there. And even in, in um, people might not know this or watching, but Hebron is a, is a biblical city. I mean, this is a, a part of Israel, in my opinion, quite, quite clearly a part of Israel. But, um, you know, that the, the, for some unknown reason, the Israeli government still don't seem to get this right. And we've had the recent conflict over the house, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, uh, I'm sorry, escapes me from the moment, the, the house which the, the Jewish people were buying and then there was all this trouble. But, but it's, it's settling the land is, is so important, isn't it? Um, it's, it was something that was vitally important to Asher. He lived in Kirat Arba. He lived in Hebron. He worked there. He was going to school because he wanted to, to contribute to the Jewish settlement in the land of Israel. And that means Tel Aviv, it means Haifa, it means Hebron, um, all of it. So if you would like to, uh, again, we want to just put on the details on the screen how you can make a donation uh, in memory of Asher. That would uh, 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 be a great blessing to you and um, right. in his memory and help. Um, so uh, it's the email address is on and um, you contact Michael and you'll be happy to answer as to how they can do that. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much for coming in today, Michael. I'm, again, we are so sorry and uh, give you, uh, send our condolences to you and, and the family as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we pray that you have strength for all, the, for all that you have to go through and, and success with, with, the, with the justice system. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been great to have you with us today, watching uh, all across the UK. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy to use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you in two weeks, same time, same station, for the next program from In The Last Days. In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In The Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In The Last Days television program. Great to have you with us and we warmly welcome you whether, wherever you're watching today uh, across the UK and around Europe and maybe even uh, watching on the internet. So great to have you with us. Don't forget you can email us at info at in the last days .com if you want to uh, write into the program. We'd love to hear from you. Um, this week we have a very special guest. We have uh, uh, Michael Palmer. Welcome to the program, Michael. And um, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, what happened. Uh, there was a terrorist act and very sadly your son and your grandson were killed um, just uh, outside of Kiryat Arba. And so we want to first of all say we're so sorry what happened. We send our condolences. I know a lot of our viewers who are watching will be upset and We'll be sending their condolences, so we're, that's the first thing we want to do. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks to your viewers as well for, uh, for those thoughts. They are helpful to us. Um, so um, the first thing we um, want to do is to just to go through what happened. Uh, if you can run us through that. and. Um, okay, so this was um, Friday, September 20th. And um, when, when was the first... Uh, the, well, what was the first time that you knew, knew about this? Uh, well, I was actually 
in the United States then, getting ready to come back to Israel for the holidays, and I got a phone call from my wife, which was probably uh, a couple of hours after the deaths of Ashram Yonatan. And uh, we heard the interview you did on uh, Marat Sheva on uh, Israel National Radio, and uh, that in itself is so upsetting, but, but what happened was that afterwards, instead of it being described as a terrorist incident, the um, original report, I understand from the army, was that it was an accident that the car had, uh, he'd lost control and, and driven off the road. Right, that's what they told the family, and when my wife spoke to me, that's what she told me. And I, um, personally, I, I know the road there, and I was familiar with the area, and it didn't seem credible to me that it could have been an accident, because in order for a vehicle to crash and kill two people, one of them, both of them strapped in, one in a car seat, you have to be going pretty fast. And that part of the road, it just was impossible to go at that speed. I was skeptical, and it turned out um, that there was actually no physical evidence that it was an accident. If there's an accident, you would expect to have skid marks. People don't simply drop the wheel and lose control. It happens in stages. There's a moment of panic or accident, and then there's pressing on the brakes. So there were no skid marks on the road. So that the, uh, the police and the army knew immediately that it was not an accident. Um, and as a matter of fact, I even have some new information on that. I got an email just today from somebody who was actually on the road at the same time in a bus, and they were stopped at the traffic jam that was caused by this. And they were told by the people there on the scene that it was actually a death due to a stoning. So it was known on the, at, on the spot all the time that it wasn't. Now, for some reason, the Army concocted or put out a story that it was an accident. Um, that's what they told the families. You'll have to ask them why they did that. I don't really know um, why they did that. They knew it wasn't correct. Uh, so we know there's terrorism being living in the land, but a lot of people watching, some things are not reported. Do you think that it's because the, the Israeli government wants to keep things, you know, that this, this image of peace in the land, or...? I don't... And, 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 as far as Asher and Yonatan are concerned, I don't think the Israeli government made any attempt after the initial couple of days to not report the story. Um, like I said, why they wanted it to be look, look like an accident, I don't know. Within three days, within two days really, they came clean and were honest and told everybody what happened. The physical evidence was irrefutable uh, from what they found in the car. Uh, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't know why they did that. And I don't know if they have other motives or whatever, so I just I mean, you can say. I can understand in a way that people want, you know, there to be this this image of peace, but I think the problem is that when the when terrorism isn't reported, it's a false image, and we need to be truthful. I think to to tell people what's really happening, and that's what we are doing on in the last days. We third, twenty eleven, and um, Asher was at home in Kiryat Arba, and his wife was at her parents' house in Jerusalem, and they were going to spend um, Shabbat, spend Saturday together at her parents' house. So. Early in the afternoon, Asher took Yonatan, his son, my grandson, put him in his car seat, strapped him in the back of the car, and headed out onto the road to drive from Kiryat Arba to Jerusalem, which is about um, uh, maybe a one-hour drive or so. It was a nice sunny day. The sky was blue. And, and the, the, this, the road 60, is that right? It's Highway 60, that's right. So he headed out onto, the, onto Highway 60, and probably at more or less the same time as he was heading out, there was a group of terrorists in a town nearby who were in the process of planning to attack a Jew. They didn't really know Asher. They didn't know Yonatan. They didn't really care who it was they got. They were looking for an Israeli car, and they were intent on killing the people who were in that car. So they had actually been practicing their method for about a month. So there were a number of other attacks the same group had had launched uh, in that more or less in that area. And so they, I guess, were, had worked it out and were probably getting more confident that they could be successful this time. So they, um, they selected a, a stone, actually, to do this. And when I say stone, uh, can I use this? I'm talking about something that's about as big as this and perhaps four inches thick or so, not, not something you could grasp in one hand. So it's obvious to anybody, I think, that selecting a projectile that size and that weight, getting into a car 
and launching the projectile from that car to another car after practicing this method for a month is certainly demonstration of really an intent to, to kill the individuals in the car being attacked. So about the time Asher was probably pulling into the gas station at Kirat Arba to fill up his tank, they were probably heading out into Highway 60. And there were two people in this car of a gang of, of five individuals. In this particular attack, these two people were the ones who were determined to kill somebody. Um, Asher headed out on the road thinking he was going to meet his wife, who happened to be about five months pregnant at the time. Um, this, the, these two individuals got into their car, um, onto Highway 60. At some point, they targeted Asher's vehicle. They um, approached it in the opposite direction. So if I can use two props, this would be Asher and this would be the terrorist. So they were approaching like this. As they got closer to Asher's car, they lowered their window, lifted up this very significant heavy stone, and projected it or hurled it out, launched it from their vehicle onto Asher's vehicle. Um, they, were, they smashed his windshield. The projectile entered his vehicle, hit him in the head, probably killed him instantaneously. At that point, the car was driverless and it immediately swerved off the road and careened off the side of the road into a ditch. And in that careening off the road, Yonatan, who was strapped in his baby carrier in the back seat, was killed. So at the end of the incident, the terrorists had killed both Asher, who was going to be 25 about a month after he was killed, and Yonatan, who was about a week shy of one year old.